Welcome to another episode of Confidence in Conflict, your destination for learning how to prevent and better manage conflict in both your professional and personal lives. I'm recording this on January 21st from my hotel room in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, We've been here since last Monday, kicking off our content licensing partnership with Transdev. And I've mentioned them before, but they're the global transit company that runs the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority. Uh, Three of us from Vislar did a four-day conflict management uh, instructor school last week. And this week, we're doing a whole series of workshops for their their, their transit professionals, as we're calling them, their operators. They have streetcars down here from the 1920s, actually, that they keep running. And then uh, another batch that they, uh, they bought in 2004, I think. And then they have traditional buses and the like. Anyway, Joel was with us last week, Joel Lashley, uh, and he's going to be who I did my uh, this interview with. Uh, but I'm also here with Tony Sherman, who uh, actually spent a bunch of time in New Orleans due to his, he had a five-year stint working with Adam Richmond. Uh, I don't know if you know Adam, but he's he was the, the man versus food guy back in the early 2000s. As a result, Tony has big time insights into the great places to eat here in New Orleans. So We've had some outstanding meals, uh, charbroiled oysters, uh, gumbo, catfish, red beans and rice, po' boys, beignets, coffee with chicory, muffaletta sandwiches, king cake, barbecue shrimp. Uh, we've had it all. So, uh, Tony, if you're listening to this, thanks a lot. We've, uh, we've just found some great restaurants. And Tony's promising me that before we get out of town, we're going to go to his, his favorite jambalaya place, which I haven't had yet. Anyway, between the work, uh, the people, the food, this has been a, a great trip. So on to the interview, Joel and I um, had some uh, just a great discussion talking about the cultural differences that we've identified uh, being in New Orleans. You know, we train all over the world, and we saw some things here that I think you're going to find really interesting. Uh, so I uh, hope you find it valuable. Thanks so much. Well, good evening, Joel. Good evening. Been been fun with you here down in New Orleans for a couple of days. Yeah, it's got, been great. Got a few more days to go, but and as you know, I'm here for. I think I already let the audience know I'm going to be here all the way through next Friday, and you're heading home Friday. So, but good experience down here in the uh, what do they call it? The Big Easy. The Big Easy. <laughs> yeah, it's so, an appropriate name. That's for yeah. sure. That's what it feels like. Yeah. So we're, um, as everybody knows, we're, we're doing this training class for Transdev, which is a global uh, uh, transit company that has the contract for doing New Orleans, um, their regional transit authority. So it's uh-huh. been a great class, very friendly folks. So what what have been the highlights so far, Joel? And then we'll get into some topics here so the, the listeners can learn what we learned this week about conflict management. Well, the highlights have been uh, the food and the people. It's been a lot of fun. Just a really interesting, fun people, friendly people. Of course, it's New Orleans, you know, the sights and sounds on uh, on Bourbon Street and stuff. You know, we had the LSU, the big LSU game and win in town, and they were up all night. You know, we were going to work in the morning, and they were just coming home, literally. <laughs> yeah, I haven't uh... – as we talked, I hadn't been to, I used to come here for big conferences and uh, every time, I mean, then you go down to Bourbon Street, doesn't matter what night of the week it was, it was always busy. But my, my wife was actually asking, was it busier because of the game? And I think, I think it was just normal busy, wasn't it? I, I don't know. I, last time I was in New Orleans, it was too long ago. It was a couple decades ago and uh, it, uh, it, so this was my first really big experience with Bourbon Street, and uh, it was a lot of fun. But I think it was – I just remember it always being busy. So, I mean, there was some beads on the on the ground that we had to walk over, and certainly I think there was more people hanging out of some of the bars watching the TV screen for the game. But otherwise, you know, guys playing the their, uh, their little drums on the street, and we saw a little, a little horn group playing. Along the street? Yep, yep. 
It was fun. Yeah, that was great. Saw some kids with uh, taps on their on their sneakers, and that was a lot of fun. But we had some good dancers. Well, should I should I spoil it for everybody and and uh, give them the riddle about uh, I think where people got their shoes, or should we let people lose ten bucks when they show up? Yeah, I think so. Let them let them lose the ten bucks. They should take the risk like the rest of us did, had to, you know. Okay, so if if you want to know what we're talking about, uh, send a send a note back uh, through the show notes, and uh, we'll get back to you on what this little riddle is. But it's the little Bourbon Street riddle that uh, where if you don't know what you're doing, you can lose ten bucks. So uh, that'll we'll deal with that later. So um, the <laughs> You kind of wonder, as friendly as people are down here, that, uh, you know, you kind of go, God, do they have any conflict here down in New Orleans? Because everybody's so nice, so friendly. So, I mean, they're all sweethearts, but obviously we've learned there's still conflict no matter where you go in the world. Yeah, where you have people, you're going to have conflict. And they caught us up on that. You know, the, the operators in the class really helped us understand that you got conflict everywhere, you know, and, uh, the homeless populations everywhere. Yep. So, you know, it's familiar in every big city in America. And, and as you know, um, we we do this everywhere, Joel. You've been all over the country. I was in the UK a few weeks ago. Um, you know, we we kind of have an internal comment that human behavior is human hate behavior. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet. Um how people interact and, and what makes them mad and what causes conflict and how do you deal with conflicts? Pretty just human nature. Uh, we're just dealing with fundamental kind of the way people interact with each other. But what, what's been interesting, you know, and I know you feel this way, what's been interesting about New Orleans, this place is a little bit different. We've learned some things that about the culture down here that we just haven't seen anywhere else on the planet. Yeah, every place is different, you know, and, and what I've learned in New Orleans really reinforced that. And the students in the class, you know, reinforced it for me. And it was, it was fun to discover and fun to talk about is that when you think about diversity, you're not just thinking about uh, people's lifestyles and backgrounds. You're also talking about regional diversity. And everywhere I go, it seems I learned something else that's just a little different. And, um, we learned that this time and even adapting some of our techniques to fit those uh, regional peculiarities. It, and Joel, I agree with you hundred percent, but I think it's the difference between a little bit different and some meaningful differences. I, my personal opinion is we found some meaningful differences in New Orleans that I don't think we've seen in other cities, but maybe um, you obviously train more than me. What do you think? Yeah, it, it was definitely a stark example and something to think about. You know, every time, every time I give a class somewhere, I learn, I learn something. And a lot of our training is an amalgamation of experiences that people of other people shared with us or things, experiences that we've had actually in training. And in New Orleans was rich with those opportunities. Well, let's talk a bit about proxemics. I think I've used this, that word before. Uh, as you know, beginning of class, I said, anybody know what the word proxemics uh, meant? Nobody, nobody, nobody had ever heard the word before. The reality, I had not heard the word before prior to several years ago. It's not a word used a lot in the English language, but it, it means the study of what? A study of human positioning relative to and each other, right? Mm-hmm. And, distance. and distance. Yep. So, well, it probably is a broader meeting in the academic world. We kind of say it, it's ta- about distance. Relative positioning <laughs> and hand placement, and uh, yep. I don't know if you know this story, but when I was in the UK, we uh, we won't go through all of them, but we have about six different proxemics things about about hand placement uh, relative to if somebody's coming at you or you need to, to guide somebody in another place, or you want to show your concern. We have a variety of things about where do you put your hands, and one of the one of the things we call it the timeout. So if somebody is really being aggressive with you, you put up the timeout, you know, the T up in front of your face and you say, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, timeout. Well, it turns out, turns out that doesn't work in the UK. You know, the soccer well, doesn't have timeouts like you have in a, uh, in a baseball game. So uh, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't know the timeout maneuver. 
Yeah, I remember hearing that. That's very interesting. And we had the same kind of discovery here in New Orleans regarding exactly. hand placement. So why don't you go through that, and then I'll tell the story about what happened in the hotel after our training. Go ahead. Yeah, that was the coup de grace. I mean, that conversation you had at the hotel really kind of tied everything together. And I shared that in class today, and the class just, uh, you know, um, really reinforced that. Was uh, when we were talking about, you know, operators of streetcars and buses and uh, paratransit, they have, um, you know, they're a captive audience. They're on a bus, they're seated, they're buckled in. You know, and their proxemic starts when they're pulling up to a bus stop. What do they see? You know, and when they open the door is when they start to communicate there. And really, the person boarding the bus, once they stopped and opened the door, they're in control of proxemics at a very high level. They're getting on the bus. They're approaching the driver as they enter. And if they're aggressive and angry for all different sorts of issues from the bus being late um, to, um, you know, not having a, a fare or bringing their own um, issues on board, uh, maybe mental illness or personal issues with someone else on the bus. And the way, we, you know, that you might manage distance as part of proxemics is hand placement. You know, you raise and present your palm in the direction of the person boarding to kind of maintain a, a, a safe distance. And a lot of the feedback was you can't present your palm to people in the world. So they'll slap your hand away. It's, it's very Hold on, just be, so be, I want to make sure everybody knows where we're, we're headed here. So normally, when you said captive audience, if you're a, if you're a, uh, you're standing up and you're like a security person, let's say, and somebody comes, comes at you, you obviously can manage distance by just backing up. Uh, a bus driver doesn't have that option. So when it comes to distance, you can't manage distance as a bus driver. You're kind of stuck in that place. So normally distance is a very important thing that you can manage by backing up, circling around, whatever. You can't do that as a bus driver. And then you get into relative positioning, which is, you know, being at somebody's angle or making sure you're a little off, not directly in front of them. Again, a bus driver doesn't have that option. They're sitting in a chair and they're stuck. And they can't control it. It's the people coming on the board on on the bus or the the uh, streetcar that's controlling the relative positioning. So they're kind of left with hand placement. And you were showing, you know, just a simple little maneuver of moving to the right, palms out, you know, saying, you know, sir, can you just step back? And it's just a little stop kind of sign feel, right? And it generally causes people to to step back because you put your hand up and it. There's just a natural response not to come any further. So, so, but here in New Orleans, it was completely different. So what did they say when you said, okay, let me, yeah, just put your hands up, a little stop sign, a little subtle maneuver to say, yeah, just step back, sir. What did you hear? Yeah, well, they said, you, you know, you can't, pre- you can't put your palm towards somebody that's very offensive. You know, people will slap your hand away. Now, Tony Sherman was in the class, and, and, you know, he's a really sharp guy with a great instructor with the proxemics principles, and uh, he showed that an adaptation where you could raise the back of the hand, right, in position so that it guards your face and also creates a barrier and maybe signals the person to stay back a little bit. And that they were very accepting of. You know, we practiced it. We drilled it. said, yeah, that's that was a great adaptation. Yep. <laughs> and, when, uh, they, well, so we, we I mean, when they said – uh, don't put your hand in my face. And I, we've never had anybody say that because we're not putting it up in their face. We're putting it just at chest level, just a simple little, you know, non-aggressive looking stop sign just to cause people to step back a bit. And they interpret it as you're putting your hand in your face. Don't put my, don't put your hand in my face, right? That's disrespectful. And then when, when that yeah, one they, lady said, I'd slap that hand away. I would slap that hand right out of there. <laughs> Right. You know, what's interesting. Sometimes in training, you run into these little nuances and you think, is that just this group? You know, is that just uh, that one person that spoke up and then he's just getting reinforced by the group? So you you don't really know what's going on. But when Tony showed him his adaptation, they were very accepting of that. We practiced it. We drilled it. We talked about how to sit, how much they can turn if they're belted in. And, you know, we, we kind of developed that very nicely. But really what tied it up, kind of brought it all together was that conversation you had with the uh, yeah. with the hotel staff. So I'll share that. But, but just imagine, Joel, in Milwaukee, 
right? Which is where we're from. Um, if you put your hand up in, and you were a, a, a bus driver, security guard, whatever, can you imagine anybody slapping your hand? <laughs> that would no. never happen. Uh-uh. And, and like several people in the room goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I would just slap his hand away. Yeah, we, we don't do that down here in New Orleans. So anyway, so so we do the training. We're over at our – we turned out because of the game, the uh, the playoff game, Monday night we had to stay in one hotel, and then for Tuesday night we had to move to a different hotel uh, because it was the, the hotel we wanted to stay in was, was all filled up for Monday night. So so Tuesday night we're checking in. The training was on Tuesday, and, we, uh, and we're here all week, actually. It's going to be four days of training. But we, uh, we're checking in, and Joel, if you remember, really nice lady, you know, checking us in. And you and yeah, a real contact yeah, she was professional quite good. man. Uh, and she, uh, so you guys headed upstairs, and they were having a little trouble finding my room or getting my room number or whatever. And so I'm talking to her just to make conversation, and I go, oh, you know, God, we were just in this training class or training transdev, you know, Joey, oh, yeah, I love that transdev, the great that's a public transportation company here. And I said, you know, and we're talking about the bus driver and how, you know, when he's, if somebody was coming on being a little too aggressive with him, maybe he would just put his hands up. And I just, you know, I'm just showing her at the side of the of the hotel, uh, the, of the little reception desk there. And I just go, yeah, I just put her hands up. She goes, you'd never do that in New Orleans, right? I would slap your hand away. <laughs> really? And I was, and she goes, yeah, we would not do that. That's just not New Orleans. And I go, well, what would you do instead? And I, I said, well, you're not a bus operator. But, for example, if you were going to guide me to the elevator, you know, to show me where the elevator, how would you do it? She goes, she kind of sits there for a minute, gets a big smile on her face, and she goes, I would do the Vanna White, right? And she opens her palms up with her palms facing upwards and kind of guides me to the elevator with her palms up. <laughs> you know, it just looks so friendly and nice, right? But that's what they're like down here. It's like nobody wants to do anything that would be viewed as disrespectful or in your face. They're just too nice. Yeah, and, you know, we shared that with the class today, your experience, and they were like, well, that's great. You know, so we actually, you know, we uh, did a, a drill where, where we used a Vanna White yeah. adaptation, you know, and uh, we uh, practiced doing things that we wouldn't have thought of before, you know, doing uh, – doing a thinker stance from the seat. So they said that was a, a good adaptation. Talked quite a bit about that. Talked about doing an emergency, emergency yeah. timeout in the seat, right? Everything was good to go, including Tony's brilliant adaptation was yeah. showing the back of the hand. So they had lots of strategies to manage their, their distance and positioning and hand placement without being offensive. I thought what was really interesting, and this is a perspective the students in the class shared a lot and certainly something we've experienced here, is that uh, people in New Orleans are they're people people and they're, they're affectionate and there's a lot of touching and high fiving and fist bumping and and strangers are friendly with shaking hands and putting a hand on a shoulder and it's part of their culture things that can get you in trouble when people are in crisis but just as far as daily socialization it's the norm and when you saw that hand that only single adaptation was is put making a gesture that feels like you're pushing me away just doesn't fit in this region. What I loved is when they uh, had forgotten about that, but they, you know, today we were talking about the kind of re retold this story and they said, yeah, the other thing, either they'd slap your hand away or they'd go, Oh, this guy wants to do a high five and they'd high five you. <laughs> and then you were given the making the point that, you know, when you're dealing with somebody in crisis, you don't want to come up and, and touch them on the shoulder because they might, you know, react and, and you might get into the, and you can explain that if you want about the, the physical reaction versus a. Yeah, we did some drills on that and we're a lot of agreement with a lot of the structures there. They said they had problems with people, you know, we showed Pablo Velasquez video about how to approach someone who's experiencing homelessness. And they said, we've had trouble with people on the bus, you know, just get a guy sleeping on the bus and they go on it and they're tapping him on the shoulder and the guy gets startled and the fight's on. So that's something that we discussed or coming up behind someone who may have, um, you know, some trauma. They may have a uh, brain based disorder where they, you know, they tend to be more physical rather than visual from keeping themselves safe and walking up behind someone and tapping them on the shoulder might get you popped. 
and we demonstrate some of that. You might but, wind but up with that back. Joel, there. So, when you uh, first said it before you demonstrated it and let people know what could happen and that, that they were at risk of getting hurt. And you said, well, you got to be careful touching people on the shoulder. They were going, oh, no, no, no. We touch people all the time here. That We're a real t- touchy-feely group down here in New Orleans, right? And then and then you said, oh, yeah, but l- uh-huh. let's see what would happen in this situation. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 I understand now. But they didn't want to hear that they couldn't touch somebody, right? <laughs> no. They didn't. But if you recall, one of their, their supervisors said, well, you know, I'm the guy that when that call comes in that a guy got popped by someone experiencing homelessness that they were trying to wake up and off the bus, it was usually because they walked up to him and tapped him on the shoulder when, you know, instead of like Pablo describes, you know, moving into their field division, tapping on a hard surface, uh, making an alarm on your phone, something that's going to wake them up before we invade their personal space. So even they were, were able to contribute to that conversation that, Walking up and tapping somebody without being in their field of vision, coming up from behind them or while they're distracted or asleep isn't necessarily so, safe. So, Joel, what do you think? Does um, does Milwaukee have better food or New Orleans? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Um, I've been sending my wife. I, I turned into that guy this week yeah, that takes pictures of their food. You know, I've never been that person, but this week I'm a guy who takes pictures of their food because it's magnificent. I mean, the, the grill, and Tony Sherman, he's been to New Orleans so many times, he knew where all the best restaurants were, of course. So we're eating like grilled oysters and and gumbo and po' boys and catfish, and it's just, I want to move here for the food. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When the one oh my God. When we first yeah. flew in. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we just found it online. I, I think that was an example where Tony didn't know. He just kind of found it, and it was voted as best catfish or something. And uh, we go there. They got red beans and rice, but they only serve it on Mondays. So it, it, it's like Friday fish fry yeah. in Milwaukee. And uh, in New Orleans, it's Monday red beans and rice. Yep. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. We shared that with the way, with the server too. You know, explained to her that, well, we got this thing in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. You know, Fish Fry Friday, and that's just something they'd never heard of here. So I like the red different. beans and rice better than the fried fish. What do you think? Yeah, the it was incredible. I, I've eaten it a couple of times since we've been in town, and it's that's something I could get used to eating yeah. every oh, day, yeah. along with yeah. the greens, um, with the ham hocks in there. Those are, yeah, it's pretty, pretty. Yeah, the collard greens, you know, I'm originally from the South, and, you know, that was the food I grew up on, and I don't get any of that unless I make it myself in Milwaukee. There are some good soul food restaurants in Milwaukee. I shouldn't say that. There, and I, and I don't even know how they do it. It's, it's, I'm not a cook, so I don't have any idea. But it's not – it's it's greens. We always mm-hmm. – I mean, you could buy those greens at a local grocery store. It's not like they don't exist. But can some, yep. They're common in the grocery stores here, of course. But there's grocery stores in Milwaukee where you can find greens, and I I, I know well, what where do they you are do. You you're not just the boiling them in some water. What do they do to make it be like it is? Well, you slow cook them for a long time because okay, you're reducing. Yep. It's like spinach, right? And spinach is a type of green, and so is collards and Swiss chard and and turnip greens and things like that. And you slow cook them. And you cook them in some kind of um, animal fat. You know, there's salt pork, there's ham, ham hocks. Uh, some people could just use simple uh, bacon, something that gives it that uh, flavor and, oh, and okay. richness That's from the uh, pork. Oh, and okay. then you introduce vinegar. And that's kind of a personal regional taste. So what you're getting is fat, salt, and vinegar, which is the staple. And the greens oh. is kind of the body that holds it together. And I'm telling you, it may not be health food in one sense or another, but I I would imagine it's a pretty good keto thing, man, because I could live on the stuff. It's, well, the, it's, it's they're wonderful. saying you're gonna, you got to make sure you have a colorful diet. You know, you don't want to eat that brown stuff all the time. You got to eat some green. Well, it's green. So yeah, maybe that's yeah. why everybody's so nice down here is because of the food. Do you think? Well, yeah, I haven't had a, I haven't had a bad meal yet, and. It, you know, the fast food joints kind of just parking lots are always empty. And well, I you know, see I, why I told my wife the um, 
And I had a similar experience in Austin, Texas. And I was down there years and years ago. But if you, and I'm, I'm assuming it's still true, that Austin is known for its local restaurants and, um, and they have some great ones. And if you drive around Austin, you do not see uh, the chains in the same way you would see in, you know, L.A. or Milwaukee or Chicago or whatever. You and, and, and that's my point. You don't hear you just, either. You drive around, you just don't see. Like, you know, you drive around Milwaukee, you see a McDonald's, Burger King, Kmart, whatever. Not Kmart, but AFC. There's something. Every and corner. Here, what I've seen one McDonald's and one Burger King. And we've driven around a lot. Right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> and the parking lots are empty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I got this kind of food around here every day, I'm, we haven't had a meal yet that hasn't been wonderful. And things that exotic, you know, things that we would consider, you know, totally exotic is normal. Like last night I had alligator for dinner, right? Um, we couldn't get in the restaurant where we went for turtle soup. Yeah, we got to get back. the line was too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and the frogs. We don't get a lot of many. alligator can't leave town without that. Well, that's what my one of my favorite things about the Southern diet is amphibian. There we Turtles, go. frogs, and, and alligators. And the crawfish. Still, still not sure what a crawfish is, but I'm looking forward to having one. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's yep, um, delicious. Let's loop back and see if the one more highlight. So we kind of dealt with proxemics in terms of this uh, conflict management training. What would is there another? Another thing that pops into your head this week that that was been uh, unique or interesting. Well, this group has been very interesting. They're very enthusiastic, very friendly people, very engaged, and the amount of conversation, the engagement of uh, these this particular group of trainers um, has been off the hook. I mean, they the participation, the enthusiasm, and the planning that they're doing already about yeah, what the, they're going to do with this material. Yeah, um, but the commitment to infectious. customer service and to operator safety is very impressive. It's very impressive. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're like, you know, safety first, customer first, service yep. second, and schedule yep. third. That's their I, philosophy. I, guess, fact, you know? I, I didn't know this, but there's and uh, so they run buses like most cities, but they have a uh, they call them streetcars. They look a little bit like the San Francisco streetcars, but it, it turns out that the uh, they have two different streetcars. Uh, one uh, group of thirty, I think it's thirty streetcars, were built in 1923, and that they're still pretty much the yeah. same as they were back then. They made a couple little upgrades along the years, but and then the other batch came from like 2004, but the 1923 ones are still using the same, you know, underlying technology as they had back then. Yeah, yeah, right. and still running like a top. And the, the ones from 2004 are basically facsimiles of the ones from 1923. You know, to the untrained eye, you couldn't tell the difference. Well, I, I think, couldn't have until I they think said there one, was one. I wasn't sure if that was a. A real color that is it, they call it the green lines or the red line was is it the red ones or I I'm pretty sure oh. the red ones are the new yeah. ones and the green ones yeah, yeah. are the old one but don't hold me any <laughs> I was telling them about I don't know if anybody's been to San Francisco but it's if you go to San Francisco it's worth touring the uh, whatever they call them out there I think they call them trolleys but the trolley main station that is the power plant for the for the trolleys because all the San Francisco trolleys run on by grabbing hold of a cable that's running underneath the ground, which I just thought was amazing. These are electric. Uh, what, do you, what do you say, 600 DC or something? There's a... Yeah, and they said they've been electric... You know, since twenty three, they've been a lot. They've you know, like back since when Edison bottom, first got electricity electric. on the ground or something. No, that was earlier than that, I think, wasn't it? <laughs> I guess. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure what Edison put the electricity in the ground, but 
the one interesting thing I uh, we found out this is the oldest running yeah. streetcar yeah. line in the world. Uh, opened in 1834. So you're thinking the residents of New Orleans yeah, were writing yeah. it during the yeah. Civil War. It's amazing. Yep. So uh, and then when it was pulled by a little steam engine, you know, we saw a model of that yep. at their headquarters, and that that was really so. Yeah, committed group, customer service. I love. Yeah, I'd forgotten that customer service, safety, and schedule was third. So if they if they got in a situation, yep, they were, nope. Yep. Safety first, customer service, yep. Yep. and then schedule. And they, they were so obsessed with making sure they kept their schedules, and that pushed everything up ahead. So I thought that was really interesting. So if they're that concerned about being on time, and they're even more concerned about their customer service, and they're even more concerned in their safety, that understands their high level of quality. Well, in they, and they talked about the um – that you know what you'd expect is probably true in every transportation company in the in the planet. That the number one complaint is, you know, not making the schedule, being late, being early, leaving early, that kind of thing. And uh, so you got to you got to get you got to be you know pretty pretty on track with schedule. But they were willing to if it became a, an issue of choosing between employee safety or ended up you know customer service where they could you know take care of some situation or whatever. That uh, schedule came in third. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, Joel, um, obviously we got a few more days. And then um, I think um, Tony and I are staying through the weekend. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, we're going to, the two of us are doing some workshops for their operators next week, which should be really fun. This week was an instructor school. Uh, next week is, is actually with the frontline operators. Uh, so that should be very, very cool. You're going to be back in Milwaukee enjoying the winter weather. Um, yeah, but I hope we're going to do another yeah, interview with, with Tony this weekend. And we'll, uh, we're will we going to be down here with nothing to do other yeah. than to eat and, uh, you know, visit the, the Mississippi River and go look at the co- Gulf Coast and whatever. So we got a few things to do, but we will have time to do another podcast this weekend, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see you uh, early in the morning, tomorrow morning. The free 6.30 in the morning breakfast. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> also good. Yeah, a little a little better than your well, and not, hotel breakfast. At least and again, if you're from the saying. North, you don't even know what we're talking about probably. But the first night we were in a hotel that didn't have the free breakfast. It was this, this hotel that was the only one left that had three rooms. Um, so instead of getting the hotel breakfast, we stopped on the way to the to the uh, headquarters for Transdev and had a, a Waffle House breakfast. So that was pretty special. So in a few... Yeah, that, that was our only uh, chain restaurant experience here in New Orleans. But we had a very friendly, something friendly about, crew, though. So somehow Waffle time. House doesn't food feel good. like... A chain like uh, McDonald's somehow. I don't know why, but it's a. I think it had a lot to do with the staff. I mean, we everybody in there was so friendly. Our server was super friendly, even though she'd been working all exactly. night since nine yeah, o'clock exactly. the following that night till that morning because of the LSU game, and still cheerful treating us her last customer like her first customer. So, you know, people really got place, service huh? down um, here in New Orleans. What's our breakfast place that it's kind of an institution in Milwaukee? Um, George Webb. There we go. I mean, George oh, Webb. George Webb's. A little different, a little different, obviously, but same basic idea, right? I mean, it's a. Yep. Yep. Same so there kind, you go. If you're from Milwaukee or the north and you know about George Webb, then you know a little bit about what a Waffle House is. So, okay. Thanks so much, Joel. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Al. Bye, everybody. Well, that wraps up another episode of Confidence in Conflict. Hope you enjoyed my discussion with Joel Lashley. Um, And then I'm hoping here soon I'm going to be able to get an interview with Tony Sherman so we can discuss more about what we learned here down in New Orleans. So uh, watch for that. And as always, if you want more expert advice on how to prevent and better manage conflict, 
Subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like this episode, please write us a review. Also, visit vistalar.com slash blog to get notes for this show, share your comments, and access additional conflict management resources. Take care and stay safe.